Hey guys, welcome to Webinar Church. I'm glad that you're here with us. Got a good, a full house here today, at least. <laughs> a, f a full house by our standards. So, by the way, if you continue to watch, is that um, we're going to be talking here today about, um, about it's time to build an, a, a, um, a life, uh, it's a time to build an unshakable life that's purpose-driven. If I could just get my title figured out for myself, I'd be doing pretty well. But it's time to build an unshakable life that's purpose-driven. And so I would just like to um, offer up a prayer for our service here this morning. My wife is, by the way, she's not here with us today. She's attending a conference virtually. And at that conference, they also offer a church service. And so I told her, I said, I know where I rank in the grand scheme of things. But they have some pretty high-powered uh, preachers um, for that event. And so I hope that, Janice, if you are watching, and by the way, you can you know, maybe give me a shout out. And by the way, I, I would encourage everybody who is watching, just do this for me, is that um, it's just, now I cannot comment while this is going on. And we've had the chat thing. We tried that to work that out. If you want to help me with the chat, uh, come to church here on, on uh, Sunday morning and I'll teach you how to run the chat. Now, I've tried to do that with my wife, and I've tried to do that with my son, and they both get frustrated with me. And so I just decided that I'm going to um, bypass that for now. But it does help me a lot to know who is watching. And so if you would just, just in somewhere along the line, say, good morning, or I'm here, or Carrie, you can count on me. <laughs> <laughs> any of those things, but I appreciate uh, all the folks that came, came out today to be with us, and I trust that that will be a blessing to you, and also for those who are watching uh, virtually here this morning. You know, God is with us. He is with us in this, in this place. He's with us in your place, wherever you might be, and that God is with us. And so let's go ahead. I'll pray. And then following that, we'll just jump right into our study here this morning. Father in heaven, I am grateful that you are God who gives us an unshakable foundation and that you call us uh, to um, be purpose-driven people. In these times right now in, uh, in human history is that we need people, we need more and more people who will ground their lives on an unshakable foundation that and um, make their lives about being uh, uh, people of purpose. I pray that you'll be with us during this time, that it will be a time of blessing for each person who is here, each person who's watching, and that above all, you'll be glorified. We ask this in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. 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 I heard you. You know, and I heard you folks too say amen. And so that's good is that um, we're, we're going to go ahead and get started here in just a moment, right after our intro. Oh, it didn't work, so I'm just moving on. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just go ahead with our message here this morning. It's time to build an unshakable life that's purpose-driven. Uh, Tony and Linda, if you want, you can come up and sit in one of the uh, comfortable chairs. Just um, do it now, because... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm confident. I would like for you to write, be right here, right, right over here, so I can look into your beautiful face while I'm preaching, you know. That's good. She has her sunglasses on and her mask, so I won't be able to see them too much. Um, but, uh, but we're talking here today about it's time to build an unshakable life that's purpose-driven. Uh, our passage of scripture that we've used throughout this study, and you know, we're going to continue to uh, go to this one in Psalm 32, verse number six. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely, surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. So regardless of what circumstances that we find ourselves in, is that we can have confidence that God is going to bring us through that circumstance. He's going to be with us and he's going to protect us and guide us and strengthen us all throughout that time. Amen? amen? All right. You know, I'm going to have to get to the place where I'm going to quit asking for an amen, and you're just going to have to pop up and say it uh, from time to time. There you go! <laughs> you know. so, all right. 
So we're talking here this morning about it's time to build an unshakable life that's purpose driven. And sometimes you can get away with constructing a building on a shaky foundation, but you don't want to make the same mistake with your life. I thought it'd be fun to start off with the Leaning Tower of Pisa, talking about uh, a shakable uh, foundation, a shakable, not an unshakable foundation. You know, here's fun fact number one about the Leaning Tower of Pisa, is that Pisa got its name in 600 BC from a Greek word meaning marshy land. And you think the architects would have figured it out <laughs> that, that, you know, that was actually one of the tallest buildings in the region at that time. And they started off, and when they began building it, it started to tilt, and so they stopped building it. How many people here have ever been there? Have you ever seen that? I know that some of you are world travelers, but you haven't been to the uh, uh, Tower of Pisa? So, um, but so they stopped building it, and then they, once again, they went ahead and tried to reinforce the soil and began building it to its current height of eight stories. And so, fun fact number two is that it's not the only tower in Pisa that, Pisa that leans. Now, I didn't know that, did you? There's at least three other ones that are leaning in Pisa, and actually, this is, do you know what the leaning tower of Pisa is? It's a tower! <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it's a bell tower. It's a bell tower for a church there. And so, that, but all, a lot of the buildings in that area are kind of leaning a little bit off kilter because of the marshy land. And so, including at least three other uh, bell towers there. Fun fact number three is that over its history, the tower has leaned in different directions. <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess it just couldn't make up its mind, <laughs> you know. That, um, and so, in different directions, mainly due to efforts to correct its tilt. And so isn't that the way it is, by the way? Oftentimes, you know, our best efforts to fix a problem creates another problem. And, that, um, and so that, uh, you know, we end up um, sometimes the law of unintended consequences is what it is. So fun fact number four, the Italian dictator Mussolini hated the tower and he tried to fix it. He thought it was an embarrassment to the Italian people. So he tried to fix it, but, but I love this, is that in his efforts to fix it, he only made it worse. And normally that's the way it is with dictators, isn't it? Is that, you know? <laughs> You know, normally that's the way it is with government in general, is that government has a great plan for your life, but all they do is they just tend to screw it up more and more the more they meddle in my life. Uh, I am just perfectly with, content with a government that, that involves itself in my life as least as possible. I don't want the government to be the solution to my problems. Yeah, I want them to have the standing army, and I think that's a good idea. And I, and, and I want them to provide the police force in our communities. I still think policing is a good idea. You know, <laughs> that I've seen what's happened to communities that have decided to go in a different direction. But, um, but, you know, let the government do what the government can do. But, you know, outside of that, just get out of my business. Is that I'm content with that. To stay out of my business and that I, I don't want to give more and more of my tax dollars to you to create more and more problem, uh, programs, uh, problems, you know, yeah, and that's normally what it is, right? More and more programs to kind of mess up my life. And so that, uh, but that's what uh, Mussolini, he decided that he was going to fix the tower, government, he was going to fix the tower, but he only made it worse. And so today, I didn't know this. The tower is open to visitors. Not just visitors to go on the outside. If you want to go on the inside, you can climb all the way up to the top of the Tower of Pisa. Now, I don't know if they still allow it to be open during COVID. You know, that's a different thing altogether. But the point is, is that you can go up to the top, but you probably need to book your tickets in advance. And I would think it'd probably be smart to also make your final arrangements in advance. <laughs> you know? You know? That thing is going to come down sometime. 
I don't know exactly when, but it's going to come down sometime. And, you know, I don't want to be the idiot that's at the top of the Tower of Pisa when it comes down. And so I'd rather just take my chances, be on the ground floor somewhere, you know, or at least on the ground somewhere around it and run. Or maybe what I would do is I just pre I'd prefer to watch it on the news <laughs> when it comes down. And so <clears throat> remember this is that um, sometimes you can get away with constructing a building on shaky foundation, but you don't want to make the same mistake with your life. Did you like that little lady? <laughs> Let me see if I can play that again. Nope, I can't play it again. So Jesus says this, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, now these are the words of Jesus, and he says this, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Why? Because it had its foundation on the rock. Everybody. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. Everybody um, builds their life on something. Everybody has a foundation for their life. Jesus says that when you make him and his words the foundation of your life, is that when, when the storms of life come, you're not going to collapse. Is that you're going to be able to make, make it, uh, make, you're going to be able to make it through those storms. But he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against it, and that house, it fell, with a great crash. Like I say, our life is either built on the solid rock, the unshakable foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ and his words, or our lives are built on something else, maybe success, maybe recognition, maybe a career, maybe even, you know, and those things are good. Maybe family, maybe health and beauty, you know, I don't know what it is, but everybody, you know, it may be pleasure. I don't know what it is, but everybody has their life built on something. You're, you're either building your life on the solid foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ, or you're building your life on that shaky ground. And it's time. And I think that one thing that um, COVID has taught us is that um, circumstances are not always stable, you know. Uh, here on the West Coast, is that not only you know, have we gone through this whole thing of, um, you know, the COVID-19 and all of the difficulties of that, but then we've gone through a lot of the riots. Uh, you know, I'm all for peaceful protesting. A lot of what I've seen on the news is not peaceful protesting. You know, in L.A., you know, they, they peaceful protested all over in uh, some of the malls, <laughs> You know, that some of the shopping centers, they were doing their peaceful protesting while they were looting. And that uh, same with Portland and, and Seattle and, and places like that is that, um, you know, until we got hit with that double whammy and now with the triple whammy. I don't know how many, how many um, wildfires are burning. There's not one, not one, there's one that's not too far from us. It's probably about, what, 30 miles away or something like that. But, you know, our skies get all smoky and, and ugly. But then I have f Facebook friends, uh, Karen Miller and, and um, Bill Gilson, who are just like right in the heart and core of that area in Oregon. That, and I thought that they, <laughs> I thought that they um, were posting photos on their uh, Facebook feed that they had used a filter on. Because one of them, that they, they had a, a picture and that it was a red, literally this thick red sky all around the town. Everything was red in the sky, completely red. And because the sun was blocked out and all of the sky was red, that all of the buildings in, in town had just kind of this dark, uh, either a black or gray tone to it. And I thought that they were using some sort of filter come to find out that's what it looks like in some of those towns in Oregon 
that are facing those wildfires. You know, I think it might be good for us just right at this moment to just take a break from the sermon and say a prayer for those folks, don't you think? Yeah. That some of the folks that who are who are right in harm's way and also um, the, um, the folks who are fighting the fires because we have a lot of first responders instead of running away and, um, and starting fires, they're running to and trying to put them out. And so let's go ahead and we'll pray. Uh, Father in heaven, we're asking for your intervention and we're asking for your mercy. Is that and we pray, Lord, that if there's some changes that can come about through the weather, we're praying that you will intervene and that you'll bring rains and, and give us, an, or at least humidity, and give us a, some, an upper ground on, on fighting these fires. Lord, we're asking uh, that you will um, um, bless us in that regard and show mercy on us. Um, Lord, we also pray for the first responders that, uh, who are putting their lives in harm's way while they go out uh, to fight these fires. And so keep them safe and help them to be wise. Give them the strength that they need and keep them healthy, Lord, as they're in the midst of breathing all of this smoke and, and, um, and ash. And Lord, we also want to pray a special prayer for those who have lost loved ones. We know that there, that there have been dozens of people who have perished in these fires, and we pray that you'll bring comfort to their families. And not only people who have lost loved ones, but people who have lost property, and some people have lost everything that they have. And so we ask that you'll be with them. Help us, God, as a people to turn to you, that we know, Lord, just from what we see in your scriptures, that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And Lord, there's plenty of things that uh, our country has done and has been involved with that, uh, that merits your judgment. But we're asking, we're pleading for your mercy upon us so that we can be a righteous people to bring glory to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. So we're talking here today about how to, it's time. It's right now time in our culture, in our country, right now in this place, for us to build our lives on an unshakable foundation that, and, to, um, and to make our lives purpose-driven. Give, give us a purpose to our life beyond immediate satisfaction and pleasure. Uh, Peter writes this in 1 Peter, or actually, uh, yeah, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 4. He says, as you come to him, the living stone... So he's talking about the foundation there, the cornerstone of our lives. He says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God. You notice he's saying some things about this foundation. He's saying that, that Jesus was rejected, but he was chosen by God and precious to him. You also like living stones, so we're, we're to be a part of this kingdom, this temple that where God is glorified, we are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, now see what, it tells us a little bit more about this foundation, this unshakable foundation. He's chosen, he's precious, and but there in verse number six, it says in Scripture, it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. What he's telling us is that Jesus is chosen, he's precious, but he's also trustworthy. Is that when you put your faith and trust in Jesus and make him the unshakable foundation of your life is that you won't be disappointed. You won't be. Now, certainly there are going to be disappointments in time, in, uh, in our circumstances. And not everything goes the way of the Christian. You know what I'm saying? You don't believe in Jesus and just everything works out hunky-dory. When's the last time I ever said hunky-dory? You know? <laughs> I'm dating myself. <laughs> but you don't put your faith in Christ and everything works out hunky-dory. There's plenty of trials and problems that come to even Christian folks. 
I know that some of the folks that are watching right now, and some of you folks that are here actually, are going through um, some serious difficulties and problems in your life. But what we're saying, what the scripture says, is that when you put your trust in Christ, you'll never be put to shame. And that over the long haul, you're going to find out that it was all worth it. And Peter goes on to say this, Now, to you who believe, talking about us, Christians, that doesn't mean that everybody out there is going to agree with us. But to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. So in other words, is that there's, Jesus is going to be kind of that line of demarcation. Some people are going to respond and build their life on that unshakable foundation, but other people are going to stumble over him and reject him. They stumble because they do not, they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you, talking about you as a Christian, he says, you are a chosen people. Let's count them up. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. There's at least six things that he talks about here in this passage. We look at, we've, look, we've seen how he talks about the unshakable foundation, but he also talks about the purpose for our lives as believers. We're going to unpack all of that in our message here today. And so it's time to build an unshakable life that's purpose-driven. Instead of walking around full of depression, instead of walking around full of defeat, instead of walking around full of negativity, that let's, let's, um, uh, let's claim our standing in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have an unshakable foundation, and we have a purpose-driven life. So make Jesus foundational in your life. That's the first thing, is that that's what it takes to build an unshakable life, is make Jesus the foundation. Now, maybe you haven't done that yet in your life. I would encourage you right where you're at to make a decision that Jesus is going to be the foundation of my life. And that, and then figure out from there, and I'd be more than pleased to guide you through how to make Jesus the foundation of your life. You put your faith and trust in him. You confess him as your savior. You turn from your sins. You surrender your life to him in baptism. And then you walk with him in faithful obedience throughout your days is that we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 11, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is chosen. Out of all the beings in reality, you know, out of all the persons in reality, and you notice I didn't say creatures, because Jesus is not a created being, is that The scriptures are very clear that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. There's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And before he came to earth, he was known as the Word. We read in John 1, 1, the Gospel of John, verse number 1, In the beginning was the Word, talking about Jesus, and the Word was God, and the the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he is both with the Father as the Son. He's both with the Father, and um, he is also um, he is uh, he shares in all of the properties, all of the nature uh, of uh, God Himself. Then we read a little bit later on in John uh, chapter one, verse number fourteen, and it says, "The Word became what? The Word became flesh." Now that doesn't mean that um, God, um, that uh, the word, that Jesus, the Son, stopped being God. No, he took on human flesh. And I've been 
going through a whole study on this here recently. I'm just I'm already up to like the lesson number 28 on it because I always have had some questions about that and how all that works. And, and this guy was very helpful to me. I, I go on a walk every morning. I try to get up, uh, not on weekends though, you know, is that a, but I try to get up and go on a little walk. And so I, I have a, about a two mile walk that I go on. And as I walk around, I listen to a podcast, a theological podcast. Actually, I do two things. I listen to my Bible first, and then I, um, I listen to this podcast. And I decided what I really wanted to do, because I've really been confused about some things about Jesus, and I've been trying to sort that out in my own thinking. And so this guy, I have a lot of respect for this guy. And so I decided I'd start listening to his podcast. And he really helped untangle some of that stuff for me. And so, you know, but it's a good way for me to start my day. But nevertheless, what we do know about Jesus is that he's chosen. In First Peter chapter 2, verse number 4, it says, As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but what? Chosen by God. Now, it's interesting to me what Peter says uh, uh, earlier on in his book is that Jesus was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. So, long before, and think about this if you want to kind of like blow your circuits a little bit, is that long before God knew, long before God created the world, he knew it was going to go off track. He already knew it. It wasn't like it was a surprise to him. But he freely chose to create, fully understanding what implications that would have for himself, how that, how that, no human being can pay the penalty for our sins, that God comes and he takes on flesh and Jesus, who is truly man and truly God, he stands in our place and he pays the penalty for sin, which I deserve and which you deserve and in order for us to be pardoned, fully pardoned by God. And so Jesus, we, we see in the scriptures, he's not only chosen, but he's precious. We're talking about this foundation that our lives rest upon as, as Christians, is that, uh, that Jesus is the one who was chosen to be that foundation, and he's precious. As we see in the scriptures here, 1 Peter 2, 4, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God, and what? Precious, precious to him. God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only, his only begotten son, that whoever um, believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Remember what the father said at the baptism of Jesus as he thundered from heaven? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And Jesus is precious. There's no being, there's no person in all of reality that is more precious than Jesus. And so that um, we come to him as our foundation and we're basing our lives on this precious foundation that God has provided for us. Think about what a tragedy it is when people reject Christ because there is no other foundation upon which to base your life that is going to give you sure, sure footing when you stand before God. But for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from your empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ. That's what it took for us to be redeemed. The precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And so Jesus gave his life on our behalf. We have the solid foundation upon which we can rest our lives. 
and Jesus is trustworthy. As we read in our text there in 1 Peter chapter 2, 6, the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. I like what Paul says. By the way, 2 Timothy is um, Paul's last book that he wrote before his execution. And we read there in 2 Timothy, Paul says this, I know whom I, I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. So what Paul is saying is that I know whom I believed in. He says, I, I've put my faith and trust in Jesus, and I'm confident that he's able to, um, to guard everything that's precious to me, my life, my dreams, my hopes, my future, until that day. He's not going to fumble the ball. He's not going to let you down. Is that you're not going to have some unpleasant surprise on the day of judgment when you stand before God and you find out, oops, wrong one. No, he's the right one is that Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so it's time, friends, what we're talking about here today, to build an unshakable life. You know, the COVID thing is serious. The political scene in America right now is serious. Is that um, the political unrest that we see in America is serious. By the way, I just have to say this while I'm thinking about it. I part company with those Christians who get all tangled up in conspiracy theories. I'll tell you why. It's a big distraction is what it is. Why is that? It's because, um, because you, can, you can go down that rabbit hole all day long and watch a million and one different YouTube videos. But you know what? That doesn't help you to become a better person. It doesn't help you to grow closer to God. What it really, what it ends up doing is just increases your anxiety and your fear, you know. And so instead of devoting all of your attention on, on crazy stuff, and who knows, it might be true, but it's out of my control. But I'll tell you what is within my control. I can rest my life on that unshakable foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can go out on my walks in the morning and listen to his word. I can do that. I can, I can listen uh, to Bible, uh, 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 great theological minds, and I can learn from them to find answers to the questions that I have. I can spend time in prayer. That's what I can do. I can learn to trust in God. I can learn to, um, to set aside my crazy and anxious fears and trust that my life is built on the unshakable foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, all of that crazy stuff, I'm just going to leave out there and I'm going to focus my life on what I can control. And what I can control is I can deepen my love for God and my love for you and my service to humanity. You know, the clock is ticking, friends. I don't know if you noticed, but you know, every day I get closer and closer to that day when I'm going to stand before God. And I don't want him to say, well, what did you do with your life, Carrie? Well, I spent my time on YouTube <laughs> looking up all of the crazy conspiracy theories, you know, and just got more and more uh, uh, angry about America or afraid about the future. I just don't think he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. He's going to say, you moron. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, that brings us to our next point. You got to start by building your life on that unshakable foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then, so... Uh, you, you make Christ foundational and you make service intentional. I've tried to do that with my whole life. All throughout, uh, all throughout my life is that um, I've served the church. 
I've served mission organizations. I've started organizations that, um, that have helped others. I'm currently involved with organizations to do that. I will promote organizations, even like Operation Christmas Child. You know, we're doing that here at Compass, and it's a way for us to, to continue to bring some joy to children throughout the world and also share the gospel message with them. You know, I, the clock is ticking, friends. I don't have a whole lot of time. It's not because I'm expecting to die tomorrow. But what I am, as I understand, is that I don't, every day that, that every day that I waste is a wasted opportunity for me to make a difference to humanity in whatever way that I can. And so make service intentional. You are chosen people. You are chosen people. You are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Thank you, Jesus, seriously, for intervening in my life when I was 17 years old because I was going down a path where I would have ended up dead or in prison. I know that for a fact. But uh, God got a hold of my life. And yeah, I understand that I, you know, at the start of it, I was kind of a crazy Christian because I didn't know any better, you know. Uh, hopefully, I've never lost my intensity. Hopefully, that it just continues to deepen over the years. But hopefully, that my zeal is with knowledge now. And so, that I want to, I want to bring... I want to declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once, you are not a people. You know, this whole nonsense is that we're all children of God. Well, in some sort of sense that we've all been created by God is true. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's a whole lot of people out there who are children of the devil. You know, that Jesus himself said that to the religious leaders of his day. He says that uh, you are, you're the children of the devil. And so when you're investing your in your life, fulfilling your own desires and following your own passions and just living the way that you want to live is that you're not a people. You don't belong to God. You're just satisfying yourself. But he says once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy... I don't know where people get this idea that God is, God is just this loving God who's going to pat us all in on the head and say, it doesn't matter whether or not you accepted Jesus as your Savior. Come on in. Everybody's welcome. If that's the case, if that's the case, is that it was stupid for Jesus to die that, uh, that if we don't have to uh, make some sort of decision about put, making him the foundation of our lives, and that's what we have to do, is that in order for me to receive mercy, is that I have to turn to Christ. And it says, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You see, just like you, I have a special calling. It's not because I'm a pastor that I have a special calling. It's because I'm a Christian that I have a special calling. And that is, is that you are the chosen, a chosen people. And so what I'm going to do with my life is I'm going to advance God's kingdom. I've done that with my service. I've done with that with my finances. I do that through my prayer. I do that through my influence. I want to advance God's kingdom in whatever way that I can. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. We're talking about how to live a purpose-driven life right now. Remember, the foundation is Jesus. And now we're focusing on six things that will help you live a purpose life. Number one is that I will advance God's kingdom. Number two, I have a special role. Is that It says you are a royal priesthood. Now, you know, in all honesty, I think that, and I don't want to offend any of our viewers who are Catholic or any of our folks who have come up through Catholicism. But this whole idea of, a, of, a, um, a, of the, a separate priesthood is not what you find in the scriptures. What you find in the scriptures is that Peter is talking to all Christians 
And he says, you are a royal priesthood. Oh, what does that mean? I have a special role. I have a special job with my life. And what is that job? To reach other people. That's what a priest does. He's, he's a bridge builder. And that he helps other people come into a relationship with Jesus. And it says right here in 2 Corinthians 5.20, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Time is short. Be reconciled to God. Make that decision. You're the priest. You really are. You stop and think about it, is that you probably are the connection, you probably, you probably are the bridge to some person in your life that there is no other bridge that's going to reach them. Maybe it's your kids or your grandkids or a co-worker or your brothers or sisters. I don't know who it is, but they're looking to you because you're the priest. You're the ambassador. And it's not because you got, you got to wear some sort of special clothes and, and all of that stuff. If you know Jesus, you know enough to invite somebody to follow him. That's all it takes. And then you can, and then you can hook the people up with other people who can answer their other questions. But first of all, they have to start down this road. Number three. Is that what's my purpose in life? I have a special responsibility, is what Peter tells me. I'm a holy nation. I'm part of this holy nation. And what that means is that when people look at my life, they should see a difference. They should see a difference in how I talk. They should see a difference in how I treat my spouse or my family. They should see a difference in the stuff that I watch on TV. You know, there's been this whole Netflix controversy about this movie that's come out and come out. And I got news for you, long before this movie came out, there's a whole lot of garbage on Netflix or Prime or Hulu or even network television that probably is not going to feed your soul. It's just going to appeal to your passion, so your lower, your flesh. And so... um. I'm going to turn from wickedness. I'm going to make sure I live a sober life. I'm going to make sure that I can do all that I can. That doesn't mean that I become some sort of weirdo. I'm already a weirdo. <laughs> There's the amen, the unsolicited amen. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. I appreciate your support. You know. But it says, nevertheless, read what the Bible says, not me. That, uh, read what the Bible says, nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Your life needs to be different. Why? Because you're a bridge builder. Somebody's looking to you. And do you realize that you are the best example to somebody of what a Christian really looks like? Of how a Christian behaves? How a Christian talks? Number four, talking about my purpose, your purpose, is I have a special identity. It tells us here in this passage of Scripture is that you are God's special possession. Now, I don't feel that way sometimes, do you? <laughs> you <know? laughs> that, uh, I feel out of, out of all of the diamonds that God may have is that I'm his little chip. <laughs> is that, uh, but nevertheless, is that he values me. He values you. You know, he loves you so much that he came to die for you, to redeem you. The Son of God, the Word of God himself, came on that mission. 
and to provide for you what you could not bring for yourself. You could never bring enough righteousness to cancel out your sin. But he's given it to you. Uh, by the way, this is what, when I was listening to this theologian on one of my walks the other day, because I was always kind of like confused about this. Um, and, and I'm not going to go too far afield on this. Okay, just give me a minute and then I'll get back to normal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but he is talking about how that um, Jesus' death on the cross uh, imputes righteousness to us. It doesn't infuse righteousness in us. Now, let me explain what that means. Imputation is a legal standing. And so when you have, when you think about it this way, and, and he illustrates it this way, and I think it's really good. When the president pardons somebody, or when a governor, either president, a governor, whoever, pardons somebody from a crime, is that that doesn't make that person um, a righteous person. They may have been guilty of the crime. But what it does is it changes their legal standing in the eyes of the state. And what it does is it gives them their full rights of citizenship back. So when Jesus died on the cross, he imputes righteousness to us. We are pardoned of our sins. But this is one of the things that really kind of like confused me a lot when I was early as a Christian, is that I was pardoned of my sins, but I knew what was going on inside of this head. And there was still a lot of ugliness. There's still a lot of uh, sinful stuff going on. You see, my standing before God is pardoned, but I am in the process of being infused with righteousness. And that's a lifelong process. By the way, here is a newsflash. Now, not for you folks, because you've heard me say this before. But you know what? We are all going to die imperfect Christians. Every one of us, we're going to die an imperfect Christian. You know, I, I, I just hope in all honesty that I don't lose my mind before I die. Because, and, no, no, serious. And, and it's nothing to laugh about, but I just hope I don't lose my mind because I know what will happen. I'll probably end up cussing and being mean and surly and, and all of that stuff. You know? And then my kids will just say, oh, that's just crazy, Dad. You got to put up with him, you know. <laughs> you know, Lord have mercy, please. You know <laughs> that um, that. Um, but the point is, is that we all, regardless of how we go, you know, we're all going to die imperfect Christians. You know, and that's why we need. Uh, but nevertheless, we are all going to die precious Christians. Isn't that wonderful? You know, stop and think about it. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus makes it possible for me to be precious without being perfect? You know, so um, this diamond has a lot of flaws in it. <laughs> Occlusions, I guess is what it's called. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cultivate, because I'm a precious person, God's precious possession, I'm going to cultivate true love for God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, he tells us in the scriptures, is that that's, uh, that's part of my purpose. Uh, now that my life's on this foundation, <clears throat> number five, we're almost done here. Number five, I have a special mission. It says that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And so I'm going to let my light shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Everybody, you know, and I, this little light of mine. You know, my, I, the only reason why I did that is that my son told me, Dad, don't sing. <laughs> don't sing when you preach because you just embarrass yourself. You know? <laughs> this little light of mine, this one is for you, Thomas. I'm going to let it shine. <laughs> let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and what? Glorify your Father in heaven. This is your purpose, is to glorify your Father in heaven. And finally, 
is that I have a special standing. You notice what it says here? Once you were not a people, so once you were on the outside, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, I stood, I stood condemned before God, but now you have received mercy. I have a special standing, Peter tells us here in this passage of Scripture. As a result of that is that I will accept my acceptance. This has been so hard for me in my life, is to accept my acceptance. Why? Is because um, I, get, I got confused between imputed righteousness and infused righteousness. And just like that criminal who's been pardoned, is that all the full rights of citizenship have been given back to me. You know, I, I, I am a citizen in the kingdom of God, and I have the full rights as a child of God right now in my life. Right now in my life, even though there's things about my life that are still imperfect. So what I have to do, I have to practice this. I have to accept my acceptance. I have to accept that pardon and live like it. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are what? We are God's children. And now, if we are his children, then we are heirs. Think about it for a moment. Is that part of the problem that I have is I have too much of a law-based thinking rather than a grace-based thinking. I didn't deserve this pardon, but I got it. I didn't deserve this adoption into God's family but I got it. And we are his children, and so that means I'm his heir, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. So let me encourage you to here today to build an unshakable life and live your life with purpose. You know, there's a passage of scripture, <laughs> you know, my wife didn't come with me to church this morning. She's watching some other preacher. Hopefully by now that she's watching me, you know. But uh, so what I did on the way to church this morning is I turned on another episode of the podcast. And I thought, well, you know, because she doesn't always like to listen to the things that I like to listen to. That doesn't mean that you know, she's bad and she isn't. She's wonderful in so many ways. But we just have different interests, you know. <clears throat> and so, but when I was listening to this podcast, uh, he quoted this passage of scripture, and I'd like to share it with you this morning. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 58, it says this, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Right now, at this time in human history, there's uh, this passage of scripture is certainly relevant for us. We need to stand firm on that unshakable foundation. It says here, let nothing move you. Not politics, not Republicans or Democrats or socialists or whoever. Let nothing move you. Always give you, see, so he says, stand firm on your foundation. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. And I'm saying the only thing that makes a difference in this life is giving yourself fully to the work of the Lord because, he says, you know that the, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Uh, sometimes I have a hard time believing that myself. You know, that my paltry efforts to make a difference in God's kingdom, uh, sometimes it just feels like, you know, what's the use? But therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen? Amen. You know. And so um, we want to just let that truth sink in as um, we move forward into our time of communion here this morning. And I pre-record our communion readings for us 
so that we're able to, um, to listen to those. And I would encourage you, if you're watching, that uh, certainly here is that we, um, you know, one of the ways that we've simplified it, by the way, is that we just buy some grapes and we have our little cracker, you know. And so the grape represents the blood of Jesus and the cracker represents his body. And so I would encourage you to take some time out in your own home. And even if you don't have any elements to remember uh, Jesus with at this time, is that spend just a few minutes uh, thinking about Christ and all that he's done for you. One of my, oops, let's try it. One of my favorite passages that talks about our justification with God is found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. It reads this, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. You know, I love those three phrases there in that passage, is that we stand before God because of Jesus' work on our behalf through the cross. We stand before God, holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. Let's think a little bit about the work of the cross as um, we meditate on this passage of Scripture. Centuries before Jesus was born, the cross has been used as an instrument of torture and death. In 519 BC, for example, King Darius I of Persia crucified 3,000 political enemies in Babylon. This method of execution was later adopted by the Romans for non-citizens and slaves. They wouldn't, even, they wouldn't use the crucifixion on their own citizens, only it was reserved for non-citizens and slaves. When Jesus Christ bore our sins at Calvary in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 24, the cross took on a new significance. There, the Savior, through the blood of his cross, made it possible for us to escape judgment and to be reconciled with God, as we read there in Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. The Apostle Paul understood the significance of the cross. He had done many things in which he might have found personal satisfaction and pride. He talks about those in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16 through chapter 12, verse number 13. But in his letter to the Galatians, he wrote, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 14. As we understand what Jesus did for us on the cross, we too will be humbled. Our feeble efforts are nothing. His work is everything. The resurrected Savior invites all men and women to come humbly in faith to him. By believing that he died in our place on the cross, we receive full forgiveness. One hymn writer exclaimed, Hallelujah for the cross. Considering what Jesus has done for us, we have good reason to celebrate. I'd like to reflect once again on our passage here in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. It says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death, to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. Hallelujah for the cross. Let me invite you to take a moment with us to remember Christ's sacrifice, his body and his blood that was given for us. Do this in remembrance of him.
know, um, <clears throat> that communion meditation at the end there, where we go through all of the flower scenes and things like that, now that's based on a passage of scripture from the book of Isaiah. And, and you know, you may, you know, of course you may know this, you may not, but, um, but the book of Isaiah was written 700 years before Jesus came on the scene. And Isaiah 53 is just such a remarkable passage of scripture that talks about the death of sac and the sacrifice of Christ. And we know that that was written hundreds of years before Jesus came on the scene. And so it's just one of the, uh, one of the, um, it's one of the ways that we know that the Bible is a book that is not merely a human book, but comes from the mind of God when, when it contains prophecies and predictions like that. You know, a partnership is what makes this ministry possible. It's a team effort, friends. It really is uh, that this is not the Carrie Decker show. Yeah, okay, Carrie Decker puts a lot of effort into making this happen. So does Janice Decker and all. But... Um, you know, it's part of my job. I understand that. But it's our ministry. And it's our ministry. And whatever way that you're able to support us is that you help us to continue to reach out to others and touch lives, not only here, but throughout the country and even throughout the world. So you can give online at webinarchurch.org, compasschristianchurch.org. You can uh, give by text, by texting the word GIVE to 833-545-4190. That's 833-545-4190. Or you can mail your gift to P.O. Box 7453, Riverside, California, 92513. You know, before we wrap up today, I would like to just... Uh, offer up a benediction. You know, a benediction is a little bit different than a prayer. A benediction is just essentially a blessing that you're pronouncing upon others. And so I want to pronounce a blessing upon you guys here this morning. And that, um, and now, may the God who gives us an unshakable foundation upon which to rest our lives, may he strengthen you in body, soul, and spirit, and may you use your life to accomplish it, his good purposes on earth. Go with God, friends. Thanks for watching today. That's the end of our broadcast.